the Galactic Council chamber erupted in chaos as the holographic displays flickered to life, revealing a sight that sent shockwaves through the assembled alien representatives. A massive human fleet darkened the stars at the edge of their territory, its sheer size and technological sophistication defying all expectations. Earth, long dismissed as an insignificant backwater, had suddenly emerged as a force that could no longer be ignored. Niran, the Vidian ambassador, struggled to maintain order in the vast amphitheater. His tentacles waved frantically, trying to silence the cacophony of voices from the 1,000 alien species present. The emergency session on Centauri Prime, called mere hours ago, now teetered on the brink of pandemonium. As the initial shock subsided, a tense hush fell over the chamber. The holographic displays zoomed in on the flagship of the human armada, a behemoth of gleaming metal and pulsing energy fields. The ship's designation appeared, HSS Titan. A transmission cut through the silence, and the face of Admiral Stephen Baker materialized before the Council. His calm demeanor contrasted sharply with the fear evident in the alien representatives. Baker's voice, steady and confident, reverberated through the chamber as he requested an audience with the Council. Murmurs of dissent rippled through the gathered aliens, but Niran recognized the gravity of the situation. With reluctance, the Council agreed to the meeting. As the HSS Titan docked at the space station orbiting Centauri Prime, the aliens braced themselves for their first face-to-face -face encounter with these unexpected human interlopers. The Council chamber doors slid open, revealing Admiral Baker and his delegation. The aliens recoiled at the sight of the heavily armed and armoured humans striding confidently into their midst. Baker's piercing gaze swept the room, assessing each alien species with military precision. Stepping to the centre of the chamber, Baker addressed the Council. His words fell like hammer blows, shattering the complacency that had defined the Galactic Council's view of humanity. He revealed that humans had reverse-engineered alien technology from a crashed scout ship on Mars, secretly preparing for this moment for decades. The Council members listened in stunned silence as Baker detailed the hidden shipyards throughout the Sol system, where humanity had built its formidable fleet. The technological leap and military might displayed by the humans sent shockwaves through the assembled aliens. As Baker concluded his speech with a demand for Earth's immediate inclusion in the Galactic Council and recognition as a major power, the chamber erupted once more. Voices raised in protest, fear and grudging admiration. Niran, his political instincts honed by centuries of galactic diplomacy, saw an opportunity amidst the chaos. Humanity could be a powerful ally, and the Vidians stood to gain much from such an alliance. Rising to his full height, Niran proposed a series of tests to prove humanity's worthiness for council membership. The other council members, eager for any solution that might buy them time to assess the human threat, quickly agreed to Niran's proposal. Admiral Baker, his confidence unwavering, accepted the challenge without hesitation. As the emergency session drew to a close, tensions remained high. The aliens viewed humans as a dangerous new player in galactic politics, their sudden emergence upending centuries of established power dynamics. Yet Baker and his delegation exuded an air of calm determination, ready to face whatever trials the Council might devise. The stage was set for a series of tests that would determine humanity's place among the stars. Both Baker and Niran began manoeuvring to secure their respective species' interests, each recognizing the other as a worthy adversary in the high-stakes game of galactic politics. As the human delegation departed, leaving the Council to grapple with this new reality, one thing became clear. The galaxy would never be the same again. Humanity had arrived on the cosmic stage, and they were here to stay. The Council chamber emptied, leaving behind a palpable tension that hung in the air like a heavy fog. Admiral Baker and his team retreated to their temporary quarters on Centauri Prime, their minds already racing with plans for the trials ahead. Within hours, the Galactic Council announced the first of three tests to determine humanity's fitness for inclusion, a treacherous space race around the Andromeda Nebula. 
Baker's eyes narrowed as he absorbed the news, recognizing both the challenge and the opportunity it presented. Captain Chen, Baker said, turning to the slender woman at his side, you're our best pilot. This is your mission. Sarah Chen nodded, her expression a mix of tenacity and excitement. I won't let you down, sir. As Chen prepared for the race, Baker and his team pored over data on the competing alien species. They identified twenty participants, each bringing unique technologies and strategies to the table. The day of the race arrived. Chen stood before the HSS Thunderbolt, a sleek vessel that represented the pinnacle of Earth's reverse-engineered technology. Its smooth lines and pulsing energy fields drew curious glances from the alien competitors gathered in the launch bay. Chen climbed into the cockpit, her movements precise and controlled. As the countdown began, she closed her eyes, taking a deep breath to center herself. The launch bay doors slid open, revealing the vast expanse of space and the shimmering boundary of the Andromeda Nebula in the distance. The thunderbolt shot forward, keeping pace with the alien vessels as they streaked towards the nebula. Chen's hands danced across the controls, making minute adjustments to their trajectory. Her eyes darted between the viewscreen and her instruments, constantly assessing their position relative to the competition. As they entered the nebula, the real challenge began. Massive clouds of cosmic dust obscured visibility, while volatile pockets of gas threatened to ignite at the slightest provocation. Chen guided the thunderbolt through the chaos, her reflexes tested to their limits. An asteroid field loomed ahead, its spinning rocks creating a lethal obstacle course. Chen's lips pressed into a thin line as she focused, weaving the thunderbolt through gaps barely wider than the ship itself. Behind her, several alien vessels collided with the asteroids, their debris adding to the treacherous field. As they emerged from the asteroid field, a massive solar flare erupted from a nearby star. The sudden burst of radiation overwhelmed the sensors of multiple ships, sending them veering off course. Chen, anticipating the danger, had already adjusted the Thunderbolt's shields. They sailed through the flare unscathed, taking the lead. But their advantage was short-lived. A sleek insectoid ship piloted by Grix, the Zarconian representative, surged past them. As it did, Chen noticed an odd shimmer around its hull. Her eyes narrowed in suspicion. Over the next leg of the race, Chen observed Grix's ship closely. She watched as it fired nearly invisible pulses at nearby competitors, causing inexplicable malfunctions in their systems. The realization hit her. Grix was cheating, using illegal weaponry to sabotage the other racers. Chen's mind raced, formulating a plan. She couldn't simply accuse Grix without proof, not when humanity's standing in the galaxy hung in the balance. No, she needed to expose the Zarconian's treachery in a way that left no room for doubt. As they approached the final stretch, Chen put her plan into action. She maneuvered the Thunderbolt closer to Grix's ship, deliberately placing herself in his firing line. When Grix took the bait and fired his illegal weapons, Chen executed a complex barrel roll, causing the energy pulse to miss the Thunderbolt and strike a nearby Meldarian ship instead. The Meldarian vessel's engines sputtered and died, drifting to a halt. But more importantly, the incident had been captured by the race's monitoring systems. Chen's maneuver had forced Grix to reveal his weapons in full view of the entire galaxy. Alarms blared as the Galactic Council intervened. Grix's ship was immediately disqualified, leaving the path clear for Chen. With a final burst of speed, the Thunderbolt crossed the finish line, securing humanity's victory in the first trial. As Chen landed the Thunderbolt, she was greeted by thunderous applause from her fellow humans. Admiral Baker approached, a rare smile on his face. Exceptional work, Captain, he said, clasping her shoulder. You've done humanity proud. While the human fleet celebrated their victory, Baker retreated to his office, he knew the real work was just beginning. The next two trials would undoubtedly be even more challenging, and they needed to be prepared. On Earth, news of Chen's victory sparked global celebrations. Streets filled with cheering crowds, and world leaders convened emergency sessions to discuss the implications of potentially joining the Galactic Council. In orbit around Mars, construction began on a new generation of ships, 
incorporating lessons learned from the space race. The red planet's surface bustled with activity as colonization efforts accelerated, humanity preparing for its new role on the galactic stage. Back on Centauri Prime, Baker met with Niran, the Vidian ambassador. The alien's tentacles writhed with nervous energy as he spoke. Admiral, I must warn you, Niran said, his voice low. Several council members fear your species' rapid advancement. They are plotting to sabotage the remaining trials. Baker's expression remained impassive, but his mind whirled with the implications. Thank you for the information, Ambassador, he said carefully. I trust you understand the value of our continued cooperation. As Niran left, Baker turned to his team. Increase security protocols, he ordered, and get me a secure line to Earth. We need to accelerate our timeline. The Galactic Council chambers buzzed with heated debates. Some members argued for humanity's immediate inclusion, impressed by their performance in the space race. Others, fueled by fear of this upstart species, pushed for more difficult trials. Amidst the political maneuvering, the Council announced the second trial, a test of diplomacy and problem-solving. Humanity was tasked with mediating a centuries-old conflict between the silicon-based crystallites and the gaseous nebulons, all within a strict time limit. Baker selected Dr. Marcus Wong, Earth's leading xenoanthropologist, to head the mediation team. As Wong and his colleagues delved into the complex history of the two species, they uncovered layers of cultural and biological factors fueling the conflict. In the aftermath, Baker stood in his quarters, gazing out at the alien cityscape of Centauri Prime. The attack had confirmed his suspicions. The stakes in this galactic game were higher than ever, and some players were willing to go to extreme lengths to keep humanity out of power. With a grim set to his jaw, Baker turned to his communications officer. Get me Dr. Wong, he said. It's time we change the rules of engagement. Within hours, Dr. Marcus Wong and his mediation team were en route to Zeta-9, a neutral planet chosen for the second trial. As their ship descended through the atmosphere, Wong studied the data on the two species they were tasked with reconciling. The crystallites, silicon-based life forms, glittered in the sunlight as they moved about their environmental dome. Their faceted bodies refracted light in mesmerizing patterns, a stark contrast to the swirling nebulous forms of the nebulons in the adjacent structure. Wong's team exited their ship, the gravity adjusters in their suits compensating for Zeta-9's increased pull. They were greeted by a council representative, a tall avian creature with iridescent feathers. Welcome to Zeta-9, it trilled. The delegations await you in their respective habitats. Wong nodded, his mind already racing with potential strategies. Thank you, we'll begin immediately. The first meeting with the crystallite delegation was tense. The crystalline beings stood rigid, their multifaceted eyes reflecting distrust. We will not communicate with the nebulons, the crystallite leader stated, his voice a grating screech. Their very existence threatens ours. Wong listened patiently, probing for details about their long-standing conflict. The nebulons proved equally uncooperative, their gaseous forms roiling with agitation as they refused any direct interaction with the crystallites. Back in the human quarters, Wong conferred with his team. We need to create a space where they can interact safely, he mused, something that accounts for their physiological differences. Dr. Yuki Tanaka, the team's xenotechnologist, snapped her fingers. What about our holographic systems? We could create a virtual environment where both species can manifest without risk. Wong's eyes lit up. Brilliant, let's get to work. Over the next few days, they fine-tuned the holographic technology, adapting it to interface with both crystallite and nebulon neural patterns. When it was ready, Wong invited both delegations to a demonstration. The leaders entered the holographic chamber warily. As the system activated, their physical forms were replaced by glowing avatars, allowing them to interact in a shared space for the first time in millennia. Impossible, the Nebulon leader gasped, its voice a whisper of wind in the virtual environment. This changes nothing, the crystallite leader insisted, but Wong noticed a flicker of curiosity in its crystalline structure. As negotiations progressed, 
Wong and his team worked tirelessly, facilitating discussions and probing for the root of the conflict. It was during one particularly heated debate that the truth emerged. The Quartz Nebula is ours by right, the Crystallite leader declared. Our ancestors mined those asteroids long before the Nebulans appeared. Lies, the Nebulan leader retorted, its form swirling angrily. We have records of our exploration dating back eons. The resources of the Quartz Nebula belong to us. Wong leaned forward, his interest piqued. This Quartz Nebula, it's rich in resources. And it lies between your territories, Wong pressed. As the picture became clear, Wong began formulating a solution. He worked with his team to create detailed economic models and projections, exploring the possibility of a joint mining operation. Meanwhile, on Centauri Prime, Admiral Baker received a disturbing report. His security team had uncovered evidence linking his would-be assassin to a group called the Galactic Purists. Baker's teeth clenched as he read the intelligence briefing. The Purists were a secretive organization dedicated to preventing new species from joining the Galactic Council. Their xenophobic ideology posed a significant threat not just to Earth, but to galactic stability. Making a quick decision, Baker called an emergency meeting with the Council. As he presented the evidence, he could see the shock and concern on the alien faces. While some Council members nodded in agreement, others shifted uncomfortably. Baker's revelation had inadvertently showcased humanity's intelligence-gathering capabilities, adding another layer of complexity to their already precarious position. Back on Earth, the United Nations Space Command was pushing forward with its Mars colonization efforts. The Red Planet's surface bustled with activity as construction crews worked around the clock to establish New Olympus, the first permanent human settlement on Mars. As Baker managed the political fallout from his revelation, Dr. Wong presented his proposal to the Crystallite and Nebulan delegations. His team had devised a comprehensive plan for a joint mining operation in the Quartz Nebula, with sophisticated systems to ensure fair distribution of resources and profits. This arrangement would not only end your conflict, Wong explained, gesturing to the holographic models floating between them, but it would also drive unprecedented economic growth for both your species. The leaders listened with growing interest, their initial skepticism giving way to cautious optimism. However, just as it seemed they were on the verge of a breakthrough, alarms blared throughout the facility. Wong rushed out of the holographic chamber to find chaos. A crystallite extremist group had detonated an explosive device near the Nebulon Habitat Dome while Nebulon radicals had released a corrosive gas into the crystallite living quarters. Acting swiftly, Wong coordinated with the human security forces on site. They contained the attacks, neutralizing the threats and minimizing casualties. Their quick and decisive action impressed both the crystallite and Nebulon leadership. In the aftermath, as the dust settled and the emergency crews worked to repair the damage, Wong saw an opportunity. He gathered the leaders once more in the holographic chamber. Today's events have shown us the cost of continued conflict, he said gravely, but they've also demonstrated what we can achieve when we work together. Isn't it time to move past ancient grudges and build a better future for both your peoples? The leaders looked at each other, then back at Wong. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, they nodded. Hours later, in a historic moment that would be remembered for generations, the Crystallite and Nebulon leaders signed the Zeta-9 Accord. Centuries of conflict came to an end with the stroke of a pen, or in the Nebulon's case a swirl of gaseous appendages. As news of the successful mediation spread, Baker wasted no time in leveraging this victory. He arranged meetings with representatives from the Arcturian and Syrian confederations, laying the groundwork for potential alliances. However, not everyone was pleased with humanity's success. The Zarconian delegation, still smarting from their disqualification in the space race, began openly opposing Earth's inclusion in the Council. As Baker navigated these political waters, he received word that the Galactic Council had announced the third and final trial. Humanity would be tasked with preventing the extinction of a newly discovered sentient species on a dying planet in a distant star system.
Baker's mind raced as he considered the implications. This trial would push the limits of human technology, compassion, and resourcefulness. He knew just the person to lead this critical mission. As preparations for the final trial began, Baker received an encrypted message from Niran. The Vidian's words sent a chill down his spine. The galactic purists were planning to sabotage the mission and eliminate the human threat once and for all. Baker stared out at the alien cityscape of Centauri Prime, his reflection grim in the window. The fate of Earth's galactic standing hung in the balance, and time was running out. He had to find a way to complete the trial while neutralizing the purest threat. The final test had begun and failure was not an option. Admiral Baker's eyes narrowed as he studied the holographic display of Epsilon Eridani B, the planet's swirling atmosphere, a toxic mix of gases, obscured much of its surface. He turned to Dr. Elena Rodriguez, who stood beside him, her face etched with persistence. This is it, Doctor. The fate of humanity's galactic standing rests on your shoulders, Baker said, his voice low and steady. Within hours, the HSS Horizon, Earth's most advanced research vessel, departed for Epsilon Eridani B. As the ship entered hyperspace, Rodriguez gathered her team in the briefing room. Scientists, engineers, and xenobiologists from various disciplines listened intently as she outlined their mission. We're dealing with a pre-industrial amphibious species called the Aquari, Rodriguez explained, bringing up holographic images of the alien beings. Their planet is dying, and it's our job to save them and their world. The journey to Epsilon Eridani B took several days, during which Rodriguez and her team pored over every scrap of data they had on the planet and its inhabitants. As they approached their destination, the ship's sensors painted a grim picture of the deteriorating world below. The horizon entered orbit, and Rodriguez led the first landing party to the surface. As their shuttle descended through the turbulent atmosphere, violent winds buffeted the craft, testing the pilots' skills to their limits. They touched down on a rocky outcrop overlooking a vast, murky ocean. Rodriguez stepped out, her environment suit sensors immediately beginning to analyze the toxic air. In the distance, she could see the dim outlines of an aquari settlement through the haze. Base camp here, she ordered, gesturing to a relatively flat area nearby. Let's get set up quickly, we don't have much time. Rodriguez activated her suit's universal translator and addressed the gathering crowd. We come in peace, she began, her words translated into a series of clicks and whistles. We're here to help. The Aquari leader, a tall being with iridescent scales, stepped forward. Why should we trust you, Sky Dweller? it asked, its voice tinged with suspicion. In response, Rodriguez produced a small medical kit from her pack. She gestured to an Aquari child nearby, clearly suffering from a respiratory ailment common among the population due to the toxic atmosphere. With the parents' hesitant permission, Rodriguez administered a treatment that quickly eased the child's labored breathing. The effect was immediate. The Aquari's demeanor shifted from wariness to cautious optimism. Perhaps you can help us after all, the leader conceded. Back at the human base camp, Rodriguez's team worked tirelessly to analyze the planet's ecosystem and develop solutions. Dr. Yuki Tanaka, the team's climatologist, pored over atmospheric data. The planet's magnetic field is weakening, she reported grimly. It's causing the atmosphere to disperse into space. At this rate, the planet will be uninhabitable within a generation. Meanwhile, on Centauri Prime, Admiral Baker received Niran's encrypted warning about the galactic purists. He immediately called Captain Chen to his office. We have a situation, Baker said, briefing Chen on the threat. I need you to put together a task force, find these purists and neutralize them before they can interfere with our mission. Chen nodded sharply. Consider it done, sir. As Chen assembled his team and began his investigation, Baker increased security measures across the human fleet. He knew they were walking a tightrope. One misstep could cost them everything. Back on Epsilon Eridani B, Rodriguez's team faced mounting challenges. Violent storms lashed the planet's surface with increasing frequency, hampering their efforts to study and assist the Aquari. 
During one particularly fierce tempest, Rodriguez found herself stranded in the Aquari settlement. As she huddled with the aliens in their resilient organic structures, she gained valuable insights into their culture and biology. As the storm raged outside, Rodriguez used the opportunity to demonstrate more advanced medical techniques, treating ailments that had long plagued the Aquari. Word of the humans' medical prowess spread quickly among the population, fostering growing trust and cooperation. On Earth, scientists worked around the clock, analyzing the data streaming in from Epsilon Eridani B. Dr. Marcus Wong, now heading the research effort at Mission Control, had a breakthrough. We can save the planet, he announced during a video conference with Rodriguez, but it will require full-scale terraforming. We're talking atmospheric processes, geological stabilizers, the works. Exactly, Wong replied, which is why Admiral Baker is making his move now. Baker seized the opportunity to address the Galactic Council. He proposed a joint mission to save the Aquari, showcasing humanity's willingness to collaborate and their advanced terraforming capabilities. This is a chance for us to work together, to save an entire civilization, Baker urged the Council. Let us show the galaxy what we can achieve when we unite for a common cause. His impassioned plea struck a chord with several Council members. The Arcturians, impressed by humanity's compassion, were the first to pledge their support. The Syrians followed suit, offering their considerable technological expertise. As preparations for the massive terraforming operation began, the galactic purists made their move. On Centauri Prime, Captain Chen's task force uncovered a network of purist operatives that reached into the highest levels of the Galactic Council. We've identified several high-ranking officials involved in the conspiracy, Chen reported to Baker. We're moving to apprehend them now. Before Baker could respond, alarms blared throughout the human fleet. The purists had launched their attack, targeting key systems on council ships and moving to destroy the HSS Titan, the human flagship. Chen's task force sprang into action. Human ships engaged the purist forces in a fierce space battle, their superior tactics and technology quickly gaining the upper hand. Evasive maneuvers, Chen shouted as enemy fire streaked past the Titan's bridge. Concentrate fire on their lead ship's propulsion systems. The human fleet moved with practiced precision, their ships dancing through space in intricate patterns. Pulse lasers and plasma torpedoes lit up the void, a deadly light show against the backdrop of stars. As the space battle raged, a purist strike team managed to slip through the chaos and infiltrate the human base camp on Epsilon Eridani B. Their mission, sabotage the terraforming equipment and eliminate Dr. Rodriguez. Major David Hawkins, head of the base's security detail, received the alert just as the purists breached the perimeter. All personnel, this is not a drill, he barked into his comm unit. We are under attack, secure all vital areas and prepare for close quarters combat. Hawkins led his team in a desperate defense of the base, the air filled with the sharp crack of railgun fire and the sizzle of energy weapons. In the command center, Rodriguez and her team worked frantically to protect their research and the vital terraforming equipment. We can't let them destroy the atmospheric processes, Rodriguez shouted over the din of battle. Without them, the Aquari are doomed. Hawkins and his team fought their way through the base, slowly pushing back the purest intruders. In a final, intense firefight near the main laboratory, they managed to repel the attack, protecting both the Aquari and the mission-critical technology. As the dust settled on Epsilon Eridani B and in space around Centauri Prime, it became clear that humanity had prevailed. The purest threat was neutralized, their conspiracy exposed to the Galactic Council. With the immediate danger past, the joint terraforming mission could finally proceed. Earth's engineers, working alongside alien scientists, began deploying a vast network of atmospheric processes and geological stabilizers across Epsilon Eridani B. The Aquari watched in awe as massive machines descended from the sky, their purpose beyond the amphibious being's comprehension. Slowly but surely, sensors began to detect changes in the planet's atmosphere and geological stability. As news of humanity's success spread throughout the galaxy, 
Admiral Baker found himself in a suddenly advantageous position. Species that had once viewed Earth with suspicion now clamoured to establish diplomatic relations. Baker seized the moment, entering into negotiations with the Galactic Council. He proposed the formation of a new Galactic Defense Force, with humans playing a significant role due to their proven military capabilities against the purest threat. Our actions have demonstrated not only our technological prowess, Baker addressed the Council, but also our commitment to galactic peace and cooperation. We stand ready to take our place among you, to work together in defending our shared interests. While many Council members voiced their support for Baker's proposal, not all were pleased with humanity's rapid ascension. The Zarconians, still bitter from their disqualification in the space race, began to quietly form an opposition bloc. On Epsilon Eridani B, the terraforming process showed remarkable progress. The once toxic atmosphere began to clear, revealing azure skies to the amazed Aquari. Rivers ran clear, and long dormant plant life began to flourish once more. Dr. Rodriguez stood on a hilltop overlooking the main Aquari settlement, now thriving in the rejuvenated environment. The Aquari leader approached her, its scales shimmering in the sunlight. Rodriguez smiled, her mind already racing with the complexities of uplifting a pre-industrial species. We would be honored to guide you, she replied carefully, but we must proceed with caution and wisdom. As the third trial neared its conclusion, humanity stood poised on the brink of becoming a major galactic power. Admiral Baker and his team prepared for their final presentation to the Galactic Council, where they would make their case for full membership. Baker stood before a mirror in his quarters on Centauri Prime, adjusting his uniform. He knew that the next few hours would determine the course of human history for generations to come. With a deep breath, he straightened his shoulders and headed for the council chambers, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Ahead. The doors to the council chambers slid open, and Baker strode in with purposeful steps. As Baker began his address, the holographic displays came alive with vivid images of Epsilon Eridani B, the once toxic world now shimmered with azure skies and verdant landscapes. Aquari children frolicked in clean, crystal-clear waters, their scales glinting in the sunlight of their rejuvenated world. Esteemed members of the Galactic Council, Baker's voice rang out clear and confident, what you see before you is not just the transformation of a planet, but a testament to what we can achieve when we work together. Murmurs of approval rippled through the chamber. Baker continued, detailing humanity's contributions and their vision for a collaborative future. But just as he was building to his main proposal, a piercing alarm shattered the atmosphere of optimism. Red warning lights pulsed throughout the station. A harried aide burst into the chamber, whispering urgently into the ear of the council chairperson. The chairperson's eyes widened, and she interrupted Baker with a raised hand. Admiral, I apologize for the interruption, but we have an urgent situation, she announced, her voice tense. A Zarconian fleet has just dropped out of hyperspace. They're surrounding Centauri Prime. The chamber erupted in chaos. Delegates shouted questions and demands, while others huddled in fearful groups. Baker exchanged sharp glances with Rodriguez and Chen, a silent communication passing between them. Before anyone could react further, a holographic image of Zarconian Ambassador Krell materialized in the center of the chamber. His scaled face was contorted in a snarl of barely held back rage. The chamber fell into a stunned silence. All eyes turned to Baker, waiting to see how humanity would respond to this brazen threat. For a moment, Baker stood motionless, his face an unreadable mask. Then, with deliberate slowness, he reached into his pocket and withdrew a small, innocuous-looking device. Ambassador Krell, Baker's voice was calm, almost conversational. Before you make any hasty decisions, there's something you should see. With a practiced motion, Baker activated the quantum communicator. For a heartbeat, nothing happened. Then the space around Centauri Prime shimmered like a mirage in the desert. Thousands of ships materialized out of nowhere, their sleek hulls gleaming in the starlight. The human fleet dwarfed the Zarconian forces, surrounding them in an impenetrable wall of advanced technology. 
gasps echoed through the council chamber. Species that had dismissed humanity as upstarts now stared in awe at the holographic display of raw power before them. Baker's voice cut through the stunned silence. So this is a human fleet, he declared, his tone firm but not boastful. We came prepared for peace or war. The choice is yours, Ambassador. Krell's holographic image flickered, his composure crumbling as he realized the trap he'd walked into. The Zarconian ships, once poised for attack, now hung motionless in space, outmatched and outmaneuvered. You, you deceived us all, Krell sputtered, his earlier bravado evaporating. As Krell's image winked out, replaced by visuals of the Zarconian fleet retreating, the council chamber once again erupted in a cacophony of voices. Species frantically reassessed their stance on humanity, strategies and alliances shifting in real time. Amidst the chaos, Niran, the Arcturian delegate, rose from his seat. His crystalline form caught the light as he raised his hands for silence. Esteemed colleagues, he began, his melodious voice cutting through the din, we stand at a crossroads. Recent events have made it clear that the galaxy is changing, and we must change with it. Niran's gaze swept the chamber before settling on Baker. I propose an immediate vote on Earth's membership to the Galactic Council. We can no longer afford to ignore the potential humanity brings to our collective future. The proposal sent a fresh wave of discussion rippling through the assembled delegates. Some nodded in agreement, while others argued in hushed, urgent tones. The council chairperson, after a moment's hesitation, called for order. Very well, she announced. We will proceed with an emergency vote on Earth's membership. Please cast your votes now. Tense minutes passed as delegates input their decisions. Baker stood tall at the podium, his expression neutral, but his eyes betrayed a glimmer of anticipation. Finally, the votes were tallied, and a hush fell over the chamber. The chairperson cleared her throat. By an overwhelming majority, the Galactic Council has voted to accept Earth as a full member. Cheers erupted from Earth's supporters, while others sat in stunned silence. Baker nodded graciously, stepping forward to accept Earth's new position. But instead of simply taking his seat, he raised his hand for silence. Honored members of the Council, Baker began, his voice carrying a weight of purpose that commanded attention. While we are deeply grateful for this acceptance, recent events have shown that perhaps it's time for more than just adding another seat to this chamber. Baker paused, letting his words sink in. I stand before you today not just to accept membership, but to propose a complete restructuring of our galactic governance. I present to you the concept of a united galactic federation, Holographic displays flickered to life around Baker, showing organizational charts, defense strategies, and economic projections. As Baker outlined the benefits of this new system, shared defense, open trade, collaborative scientific endeavors, the chamber buzzed with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. This is not just about Earth, Baker continued, his voice rising with passion. This is about all of us, a chance to forge a true galactic community, where every species can thrive and contribute, where we face the challenges of the cosmos not as separate entities, but as a united force. As Baker's words echoed through the chamber, delegates began to nod, first hesitantly, then with growing enthusiasm. Species that had once viewed each other with suspicion now saw potential allies. Those that had feared humanity's rise now envisioned a future of unprecedented growth and security. The chamber doors slid open once more and a new delegation entered. The Aquari, led by their high chieftain, made their way to the center of the room. Their scales shimmered under the chamber's lights, a living testament to the transformation of their world. The high chieftain stepped forward, its large luminous eyes scanning the assembled delegates. When it spoke, its voice was a harmonious blend of clicks and whistles, translated for all to hear. We stand before you as living proof of what can be achieved when we set aside our differences and work together, the chieftain began. Humanity came to us not as conquerors, but as saviors. They, along with those who chose to aid them, gave us back our world, our future. The chieftain's gaze settled on Baker. We pledge our civilization's commitment to this new galactic order. Let our story be a beacon of hope, 
a reminder of what we can accomplish when we unite. As the Aquari chieftain's words faded, a palpable shift could be felt in the chamber. Species that had been hesitant now voiced their support for the United Galactic Federation. Even the Zarconians, still smarting from their earlier humiliation, but impressed by human capabilities and fearing isolation, reluctantly agreed to join the discussions. Momentum built rapidly. Delegates huddled in groups, excitedly discussing the possibilities this new order presented. The council chairperson, sensing the mood of the chamber, called for order once more. It seems we have much to consider, she announced. I propose we recess to allow for formal discussions on this United Galactic Federation concept. We will reconvene in one standard day for a final vote. As the delegates filed out of the chamber, the air was electric with possibility. Baker found himself surrounded by a throng of representatives, all eager to discuss the details of his proposal. He caught Rodriguez's eye across the room, sharing a silent moment of triumph amidst the whirlwind of activity. The next twenty-four hours were a blur of negotiations, strategy sessions and impassioned debates. Baker and his team worked tirelessly, addressing concerns, refining proposals and building coalitions. As the hour of the final vote approached, a sense of historic change hung in the air. The council chamber, when they reconvened, was packed to capacity. Additional holographic projectors had been set up to accommodate the overflow of delegates and observers. Baker took his place at the podium, his uniform crisp, his posture straight, despite the exhaustion of the past day. The council chairperson called for the vote on the dissolution of the current Galactic Council and the establishment of the United Galactic Federation. As delegates cast their votes, Baker stood motionless, his heart pounding in his chest. When the final tally appeared, the chamber erupted in cheers. The motion had passed. The Galactic Council was no more. In its place would rise the United Galactic Federation, with Earth as a founding member. Baker stepped forward ready to address the assembled species as they stood on the brink of a new galactic era. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.